Hi. Here I sit with the scanning electron microscope. It consists of a vacuum chamber where you can put in your sample. On top of it you have an electron gun that shoots the electron on top of the sample and scans across it. Around the vacuum chamber are different kinds of detectors. The most common ones are secondary electron detectors and backscatter detectors. But there are more, more advanced ones than those as well. Beneath here, under the, ta under the table, is the, the vacuum system. To control this device, you use joysticks and some kind of keyboard. And then you can look on the monitors to see the results. Right now, is, we can see a camera that shows the content of, of what's inside the chamber. So this is not the electron microscopy feature. It's just a basic camera. All right. This microscope works by using different kind of detectors. And the thing that you see pointing out here around, that is the detectors. This secondary electron detector works like that when you shoot the electrons from the gun into the sample, those will generate secondary electrons in the sample that jumps out. And those are attracted to this detector by electric field and, and then collected and measured. And thereby you can create an image. On this side, you have the backscattering detector. This is the control unit for it, but the actual detector is located here inside, just beneath the gun. And it works like that when the electron gun here shoots electron at the sample, some of those are reflected back upwards again and can be picked up by this detector and create that is called the backscattering image. Uh, a new, more modern SCM will have that uh, detector inside the lens package here in the gun, and then it will be called an in-lens detector instead. The backscattering detector here and the secondary electron detector over there are the most common detectors that you will probably use most of the time. And uh, the, the theory behind how they work are not so complicated, and I think it will clarify a few details if I go into a more detail around it. So, I will take out my drawing pen and show you some details on this now. So here I draw a vacuum chamber of the microscope. And in the bottom I have the sample stage that we can move around with the sample on top. At the top and at the right side we have the gun respectively the secondary electron detector. The gun shoots the electron beam into the sample. And you can see that the sample has a small cave here also that we now hit. When the beam hits the sample, secondary electrons will be emitted. And these will be collected by the secondary electron detector because it has an electric field around it that attracts the electrons. Sort of like a vacuum cleaner. Some of the electrons, due to this cave that we're scanning now, will actually come out from it and hit the detector. But some of them will also be, be hindered by obstacles and things. And due to that, you will have a shadow casting effect that depends on the position of the detector. If you move the detector more up to this top alongside the gun, then you will reduce this shadow casting effect. You can compare this to a system where you have a light torch and you shine light straight across the sample from the side. Then you know it will cause shadows. And if you have your eye point located at the viewing point at the top where the gun here is located, then you will see this typical shadow casting effect. So it's sort of the reverse. So here I put in a secondary electron image taken with the microscope. Here you can see the typical shadows. And the detector here is located at the top right in the image. And you can see that the shadows is at top right of all the holes in the pictures. And the high bright spots are on the bottom left region. So that's the typical shadow casting effect due to the detector position. So now let's discuss the backscattering detector instead. The backscatter detector is located right beneath the gun here. And this detector picks up the high energy electrons that are backscattered from the sample when you shoot at it. The number of electrons that are backscattered is depending on the material that the sample is made of. If it is heavy elements, then they will generate more backscattered electrons, and that will emerge as whiter colors in the image. So let's put in another microscope image of the backscattering detector. 
And here it is. It is the same sample surface as that we saw earlier with the secondary electron detector, but here it is in backscattering mode. Now you can clearly see that the contrast differences here is mainly due to material differences in the sample and not so much topography surface. And you can also see that the shadow effects are very little in this picture as well because this detector as I draw before is located right atop the sample, right beneath the gun. So here is another slide again of the backscattering image. This is a lower magnification. I just want to show you what you can do if you use an X-ray unit on the microscope as well. So here is the EDX mapping of the elementals of the material. This blue image represented the elements. Red means the aluminum and blue means the silicon. So now you can actually see that the backscattering images contrast is depending on the elements in the material. So let's go back to the drawing board again. If you shoot with higher voltages, then they will penetrate more deep into the sample and generate more information from the bulk instead. And that means that when you scan the surface, you will sort of get some average value and that will smoothen out the effect. So at high voltage, you will have this profile of the surface contour. But if you compare it to the low voltage instead, the blue curve that I draw here, it will be much more detailed. So in general you can say if you drop the voltage you get higher details, but if you increase the voltage it will be a more smoother image with more information from the bulk. Okay, I think this is enough for today. Now let's go back to the microscopy room. Another very common detector is the, to have an X-ray detector. If you have that then you can characterize what kind of material the sample is made out of. This microscope doesn't have that, but the one on the back here, you see the microscope over there, has one of those detectors. And this detector you see here, this box thing with this bent uh, pipe here, that is the X-ray detector. And uh, this X-ray detector works like it has a tank here of liquid nitrogen that you need to, to cool the detector, otherwise it will not work. And the detector is inside here and the, the, it works like that the gun here shoots the electron at the sample and when the electrons hit the sample they will emit the x-rays that are characteristics of the material that the sample are made of. So if you measure that characteristic x-ray with this detector then you can get a clue about what the, the content of the material is. So it, this is sort of based around the atomic number of the elements. And then you can make an elemental mapping of the surface of the sample. And uh, that is very neat because then you can see which region contains which elements. Here you have the cathode luminescence detector. It is used when you have environmental pressure inside the chamber. This system can have work at higher pressure ranges than a normal uh, standard SEM. When the electrons are generated in the sample and jumps out, they will interact with the gas and create light. And uh, that light can be picked up by this detector and then you can form an image. You use this uh, kind of detector system because uh, the secondary electron detector that is used in high vacuum will not work if you increase the, the pressure. So you need to have different detectors for different uh, pressure ranges. So there is also a third detector here that's also for another kind of pressure range that works in a different way but uh, can, can achieve an image also. So this is how you change the sample. You open the lid after you have released the vacuum. Then you unscrew your sample from this side. Remove it. And this time we're going to use several samples at once so we're going to have to remove this one as well. Like so. Then we screw our samples tight on this, this other holder. And we have several. Like so. So, that's it. You can control this stage, it's electrical driven, right? And that's how you change the position of the sample. So it has uh, several direction capability. Close the lid when you're done and start pumping the vacuum. 
The scanning electron microscope basically works, works like an old cathode ray tube television. The electron beam in this gun scans across the surface back and forth like this. And the image is represented here on the screen. The smaller, the smaller area you scan here, the higher the magnification will be. So now when the vacuum has pumped ready, I'm going to start up the gun. And then I'm going to let you sit by here and watch some of the screens and see how the actual scanning procedure proceeds. I turn, so I turn the camera over here. So you have, have one screen to look at. That would be nice, right? Here you can see that the vacuum is ready now on the screen. So here you saw a piece that's moved around. This is the control stage you saw before. This triangle piece up top here, that's the gun. And what you see here to the right, and this little piece here, and, and this uh, transparent rod here, that's three types of detectors. Here I rotate the sample holder. And you remember there were different samples that I put in. So then we can select out the one we want to check. To remember which sample is which, it's nice to tag them. And here you can see I put a small little copper piece. And that means that this is the number one sample. If I put in two pieces, I know it's the number two. That's just a neat way. So here you can see two TEM grids. One, the top one here is turned upside down compared to this one. And if you look down in this corner, you can actually see that there is some cracks here. That's the cracks you see in the carbon film that's coating the grid. At the moment we run at 10 kilovolts. Now let's see what's happening when we go down in kilovolt range. So here comes the picture now. You remember I said that one grid was turned upside down. And as you can see now, the top grid here that slides on top of this one that's down here. Here you can see the copper mesh, but you can't really see it down here. That means that the, co that the carbon film that's coating the, co the copper mesh is on the top side here, but here it's beneath the copper mesh. So here you see that the carbon film is beneath the grid. That's why we can see the copper bars. Here we barely see them. So when we decrease it to accelerating voltage, the, the carbon film becomes non-transparent. All right, I think uh, that's it. Now I show you the SM and how it operates with its uh, different detectors and techniques and uh, yeah, the general idea behind it. Hope to help you. See you next time.